So Stephanie, can you start with attendance? I would be delighted to. Uh, Becky Beisel? Here. Brian Davis? Here. Lisa Hadin? Here. Scott Gergen? Here. Dave Campbell? Here. Stephanie Mom? Here. And Kelsey Wicks? Here. All right, first up is a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right, the approval of the minutes from the September 22nd regular board meeting. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right, in recognizing our visitors, thank you to everyone who is tuning in on Hastings Community TV or who is sitting out in our, um, I guess, audience today. Um, and we appreciate you taking the time to follow the school board. So announcements and recognitions. All right, at this time I'll call Craig Beisel up. Uh, our good news for tonight, um, we've, uh, Craig's been working with the Rotary and I uh, wanted to acknowledge um, some folks here tonight that have been doing some volunteer work uh, with Craig and uh, I have a slide deck that he's given me so I'll turn it over to you Craig right away and then I know we've got some people that we want to introduce uh, that are here. Very good. Um, basically I just got the pictures up there you can just kind of go through them as you uh, see the need. Okay. So, uh, good evening everyone. Um, thanks for allowing me to speak at your meeting briefly this evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Craig Beisel. I am with Axia Home Loans here in Hastings. I'm an ambassador with the Hastings Chamber of Commerce. I sit on the Hastings School Board Community Engagement Committee and I'm an active member of the Hastings Rotary Club. I am here tonight on behalf of the Hastings Rotary Club. As most of you are aware, we recently hosted our Rivertown live event on September 11th. Our event this year was very, very successful. We were met with some challenges and changes that relied heavily on our volunteers. Countless hours were offered by many Rotarians and community members. Without all the donated hours, we would not have been able to have such a great event. It was great to see all the support from area businesses and the community as a whole offered. This year, I was a part of the planning committee. My main role was to recruit volunteers and help with putting the event on. Our event had well over 100 volunteers. As part of the planning and need for help, we were initially asked to offer additional help to cover many areas of the setup and cleanup. Due to my ties with the football and wrestling coaches, I sent a note to see if we could obtain help with just the teardown and cleanup for Sunday following the event. During my communications with the football coach Dana Strain and wrestling coach Tim Hanneberg, I also exchanged messages with the athletic director Trent Hansen. Upon communication with Trent Hansen, I was met with enthusiasm and the want to help out in other areas. As the event planning transpired, it was communicated to us via the event coordinator that additional assistance would be needed in other areas. Luckily, I had the option of tapping into the resource of Trent with re um, luckily I had the option of tapping into the resource with relying on Trent's offer to help in other needed areas. We were notified that staging and lighting crews would need help with some unloading, setup, and taking down throughout the entire weekend. If it wasn't for the athletic department of the Hastings High School, we would not have been able to handle many of the curveballs that were sent our way. The hard work and attitudes portrayed by the athletes and coaches was highly noted by many of the crews. I like to think some of the athletes created some memories. We had some athletes get asked to help with the headliner sound check. It was fun to see them given this opportunity and see the pure enjoyment of the athletes to help out and have fun with this. The girls soccer team was able to get a quick picture with nationally recognized performer Chris Cruzy. Mr. Cruzy was the runner up of season 15 on The Voice and is quickly rising in fame on the national level. The athletes who helped out during the event showed much respect for the artist's privacy, albeit some were indeed able to see national artists up close and personal. Most of them had no clue who Sarah Evans was, but most had heard of Gabby Barrett. The weekend did not, um, the weekend did indeed seem to get long for some of us. Our stage and lighting crew were light-handed with labor. There were many times the athletes were asked to endure extra work that was not expected. The additional need for help was welcomed by all involved when asked. 
Sunday during the teardown with the football team, it was expected to have athletes help until noon. The stage handler would have been left by himself had it not been for six football players graciously agreeing to stay late. Albeit I did offer to buy them lunch if they stuck around. Of course, after offering them to buy lunch, I realized I had forgotten my wallet. <laughs> I arranged with Tasha Nelson, the owner of the bus and nut, to allow me to send the athletes to her establishment on their own and I would come back later that week to pay. When I went back to pay, it was shared with me how respectful and well behaved the six football players were. The entire interaction with the Hastings Athletic Department was amazing. The help from Trent Hansen in coordinating times with the various coaches and teams made much of my work flow smoothly. The patience and hard work from everyone was amazing. I have received various communications from many members of the community letting me know how impressed they were with how we had coordinated and involved the high school athletes with, with our main fundraiser. I took a lot of credit with pulling off a smooth event when a lot of the recognition should be given to Hastings Athletic Department, the coaches, and all the athletes who chipped in with positive attitudes and smiling faces. The Hastings School should be proud of the work and time the athletes put in. They were a part of something bigger than they can ever imagine. Um, tonight, we do have Scott Meyer, Jamie Swanson, Greg Sandcamp, Tim Slatmacher, and Marissa Welch here. Um, I was gonna say stand up, but they're cool. Um, <laughs> what, I, um, I, what I will say, well, it does bring me great pleasure to be here on behalf of the Hastings Rotary Club to announce and give a donation of $1,000 to the Hastings Raiders Booster Club. The Rotary Club looks forward to more projects and events that will hopefully involve uh, much needed help like the assistance received from Rivertown Live. Thank you for your time today and I'm happy to field any questions that's, or comments from anyone. Thank you so much for coming. Lisa? Yeah, I was just gonna say thanks for coming and sharing that because maybe people saw a few of the photos on Facebook, but um, it's really important to call out that that place where we can connect students to our community and you know that they are out working hard and being respectful and learning those roles about how to be you know a good citizen so thanks for taking the time tonight to oh, come okay. and talk to us about it i really appreciate it you bet. my pleasure cool thank you yeah thank you again So next up, we'll move into our items for discussion, beginning with the middle school program review and secondary scheduling. Good evening, school board members. It's a pleasure for us to be here to explain some exciting things that we have going on with Oh no! <laughs> Hi, Rachel. <laughs> that was wonderful. Oh, I love it. <laughs> ah, so, um, thank you for having us here tonight. We're excited to provide some information and update on where we're at with something exciting that we have going on with our middle school and secondary overall programming and scheduling. So something that's really exciting for us is when we think about the community coming together as staff and students and families, telling us what those daily desired experiences are for students and what they want to accomplish and what our values are, um, we have the opportunity right now to look at our middle school and our high school and say, how are we meeting the needs of what our community, our staff, our students, and our families would like for their experience to be? So we're at this wonderful point of looking at the middle school as a program review in its holistic view of everything that's offered in the middle school experience in grades five through eight. And then alongside that, we're also participating in a secondary scheduling institute with the district management group that allows us to look at opportunities we have within our schedule to offer more voice and choice for students and how we make opportunities happen that um, people would like more of. So as we go through this process, we're anchoring it in the core values that we have and what people want to see and want our students to experience. So we are being driven by those values and those ideals. So it's an exciting time to align that. So a basic overview as we start this process, 
of um, what this programmatic review and scheduling institute encompasses and our why, right? We do everything we do for our students. So when we think about that, this gives us the opportunity to be very intentional in everything that we offer for students. So it gives us the opportunity to start with the middle school and say, what is the experience for a fifth grade student at Hastings Middle School? A sixth grade, a seventh grade, and an eighth grade student. And what are the things that students love and we wanna continue with? And then what are some opportunities for improvement that we have and how might we do things some in different ways? So another piece of this is making sure that we have equitable opportunities for every student. So how are we ensuring that students have experiences and opportunities to achieve at the highest levels that they can achieve at? So we'll be looking at data and looking at student participation, student engagement, course electives, um, and what that means in that experience at the middle level. We'll also be looking at how the schedule designs the experience. And we're gonna be challenging ourselves to say not what the schedule is designing for our students, but what do we want to design with our schedule for students. And so we'll be taking a different approach to just think proactively about how it is a student-centered design schedule. So we'll be looking at priorities and practices and naming what currently exists and um, getting input from students from staff and from families and community members about what their experiences are and also what they would like to see through middle school programming. We'll also be looking very specifically at time allocation, course offerings, and also how we're utilizing staffing. Um, so for example, is it the eighth year we've maybe been in a fifth through eighth grade model for middle school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we look at that, how do we intentionally make sure that fifth grade is a part of that experience and what developmental needs do they have all the way up through their eighth grade experience so that we're designing it that way. So along the way, we get to look at opportunities for improvement and then also with staff and students and families celebrate those things that mean a lot to us. So as we kick this off, we've spent some time as an administrative team just talking about our why. Um, and everybody is really excited about this when we think about being intentional in alignment from fifth grade up through the senior year. That we don't just experience middle, middle school in its entity alone, right? It's part of a system as we go through the um, K-12 experience. So um, administrators, why is just making sure that fifth grade experience is really intentional and how they're experiencing the transition to the middle school because that is a big transition, right? Um, transitioning from elementary to middle school and then also middle school to high school. Looking at that alignment piece, spending a lot of time looking at our social emotional learning framework um, and also how we offer a continuum of supports for students from gifted um, and talented special education and English language learners. We're also looking at um, having students help design and give input into what their experience looks like. So the big picture of all of this with designing um, the experiences for students is making sure that we are matching our resources to what those needs and desires are and making sure that we're being as efficient as possible and that we're thinking outside the box to provide what it is we'd like to provide. So that's the basis of the start to our work. And so as we go through this, but he was, does get to I talk. I thought I was doing the bottom part. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did? Yeah, that's all right. Oh, I I'm so just sorry. We take it from here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> you're going to do the top Oh, okay. Oh, well, you can do the bottom here. Yeah, so, so right now we are uh, we're in that communication phase, obviously sharing information with you. Um, we haven't really done a formal kickoff with, with our staff even. So I did send them an email just to let them know that we're sharing this information with you. I mentioned it earlier in the year and then things happened. You know, we had a few things going um, in September. So, so uh, it, it's been on their radar, but, um, but I think developing that uh, progr programmatic review team is, a, is one of my next steps. Um, we've been gathering information from surrounding districts. Um, so we've been hearing back from quite a few, still have a few to, to hear back from, just to collect that information, maybe to expedite a little bit of that time. When we do have that group together, we can share that information and not have to wait um, because it, it does take a little bit of time for them to get back to us. So, um, so I think that, that developing that middle school uh, team Will, will be another part of that kickoff. 
um, and then working through that guiding change. Uh, you know, that guiding change process document has worked so well in so many things that we've done. Like we used it when we had the, the, behavior, the behavior group. Um, it's just a very unifying process, and I know that you, I think you all have gone through that in different parts. Um, so a great thing that, that Bob brought here, uh, you know, maybe it existed before Bob existed, but it was a, a great thing. Um, so it's just a great process. So look forward to doing that in this uh, part. So that's this month, and then, you know, November's just around the corner, um, you know, needing to develop uh, the surveys for students and parents and staff um, to, to get that feedback on the, on the areas that we want. And uh, you want to mention the, what we're using for the feedback? Yes, that'd be great. And I forget the name of it. Though. Panorama. Okay. <laughs> um, Panorama. So uh, not having to create Google surveys and do all that stuff, but having a, a system that's going to collect that information and, and make it uh, quick and easy to uh, understand. So. Um, but that, and the middle school best practices, I think that's basically what we what we'll be collecting from other districts, like what they're doing. But then also, really looking at the, the things that um, through the American middle school. No, system. what's the book? Brother? This we believe. Thank you. Jeez, I, I should have teamwork. Been host. I know, um, and I'm the one that like, bought the dang book. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this this we believe is a uh, um, in its I think 17th edition. It's it's existed for quite a while, uh, but using that as, um, as a bar uh, for us to look at uh, in terms of what high quality middle schools um, do in practice. So, and then the affinity focus groups, can you speak to that a little bit? Mm -hmm. yeah. So one thing that I understand, um, we did last school year to get feedback from fami families were um, very specific intentional invitations for affinity groups and we're going to be hosting those as well to make sure that we're getting a broad array of voices um, and input with the middle school experience. Oh, and then working into the, the December, doing the, the review and analysis of that guiding change, um, taking the survey results and starting to pull some of that stuff together. Um, and also pulling in those points of pride and, and opportunities for improvement and, and maybe start to, to form a little something at that point um, with the idea of um, then continuing the review and analysis into January, um, and then figuring out what our implications for planning would be. So that's the top part. Okay, perfect. Would you like to take the one? No, you. Okay. So alongside that, um, as I shared earlier, we have the Secondary Scheduling Institute with DMG or the District Management Group. And that is a perfect complement to us going through a middle school programmatic review because, again, we want to make sure we're looking at the holistic experience for our students and not just one um, entity at a time. So areas that we've been engaging with is looking at the research around strategic scheduling and also academic learning time. So this week we actually um, had a webinar and we started looking at how much of our academic learning time in our schedule is spent on core instruction um, non-core instruction and passing time and social emotional learning time. So it's a very holistic view of that. Um, and we're going to be looking at the research and the anchoring of that alongside that guiding change document. So along with looking at overall with our secondary schedule and the middle school program, you know, what are those desired results um, and what's our current reality, but also what's the anchored research that we know that we're going to put things in place that truly make a difference for our students. So alongside that, we receive coaching that's very specified for Hastings, which would be really helpful um, from their team of experts. And at that point in November, we'll also start looking at elective course management. So what are the elective options that we have at the middle school and at the high school? And how does that open up opportunities? And what opportunities would students appreciate with electives? And then what are maybe some barriers to students being able to select the electives that they like? So that's where we'll engage more with students on voice and choice so that they're bringing their desires and interests to the table. At the same time and throughout all of this, we'll be looking at equity and who are the students um, that may face barriers in our system that are unintended, that we are unaware of, that this process uncovers, that we can then dive into and say, okay, we've recognized that that's a barrier for um, this student or these groups of students. Um, how might we do things differently so that we have an equitable opportunity? And then amongst that, we're also looking at different schedule models. 
um, as we go through this. So then we have more coaching. And then in January, um, we're gonna look at more student-centered staffing models and also teacher planning time and just an overall um, view of planning for scheduling success. So as we go through this process, um, and as Steve said, we're just kicking off communication this week that will go public um, throughout the community and then also more with the middle school staff specifically because they're in the full programmatic review, whereas the high school is a part of the scheduling institute and that may expand as we go, but we're starting at the middle school with the program review specifically. Um, and what we'd like to discuss is the opportunities for us to keep providing updates to you as you would like to have that information as we progress through this. Um, because as we think about planning out, um, if we're looking at opportunities, um, both short term and long term, we would wanna bring that to you. So something that I've connected with Superintendent McDowell about are tentative dates that are on the December calendar for you. Um, and possibly looking at um, December 1st or 15th um, along with December 8th, so depending upon your schedules, because by that time we'll have progressed pretty thoroughly into the process to have an idea of this is what we're hearing from staff and students and families in the community and here's where we're at with looking at what they want compared to what is and filling in those gaps and looking at how it might. So, and then of course, after that timeline and after we get further into the process in January and then into February, we would continue to bring that information back to you. Questions? All right, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, oh I was just gonna ask you, uh, Richard, I don't think you had a chance to talk about rigor as you oh. went through the list. Could you just share a little bit about how that looks in the Scheduling Institute? Yep. Yeah. So the, the concept of equity and rigor is looking at making sure that all students have access to high levels of rigorous learning that they need. So it's synonymous with just making sure that every student has the ability to achieve at the highest level that they can. And how are we offering a schedule that provides that? So making sure that students have, let's say they max out on course credits by the end of their junior year. Right, how are we still offering rigorous learning opportunities that are personalized for them their senior year or um, something that's challenging depending upon levels and needs of students for various courses? Mm -hmm. I was just gonna ask, um, when you come back to us in December, what do you expect success to look like? Is it check boxes by these items or a deliverable or what how, how will we know that things are going well that's number one and then number two what what if any roadblocks do you have right now to starting this and is there anything that we can do to help Ooh. great questions um, i mean i i i think a, a, a big measure of success would be um, having that um, that programmatic review team being in a place um, where we would be a lot more clear on what the feedback is from from our focus groups, um, and I'm just I'm just making up kind of off the top of my head. This is a bigger question probably that I can answer thoroughly right now, but um, but I do think having that information um, along with the points of pride, along with that to to at least have options that we can be looking at at that time. Um, is it best to have semesters? Is it best to, I mean, I know we've, we've always we've had trimesters. You know, all the questions that are gonna be, that are gonna come up during this, um, I would hope that we would be in a spot um, where that um, would be clearer than it is right now. Um, I, I'm pretty excited, I just wanna make one comment about the Secondary Institute is, but the neat thing about that, um, in, in the, the three three districts that I've been in in my career, I've never been in the same room, and I've all, and I've, I've always been at the middle school. I've never been in the same room as the high school in terms of planning. So for us to be in there, that five twelve alignment, um, I still also say we should be aligning down with the elementary too. But that's a whole other can of worms. But um, but that five twelve alignment, like, are we doing the things that we need for kids? Um, before they leave us and, and head to the high school. 
and being in the same room with that team is is powerful because we can you know, have some pretty high level conversations and, and, and do a lot of that work. There. So it's, a, it's a new thing. I don't know if you have any other specific things that you think would be success. Yeah, you know, I'm excited to hear what those points of pride are. Um, and then look at that alongside the data that we have um, to say what are we really offering and what does that tell us um, about who we're serving well, who we can serve better, and then comparing what we know that to be along with our stakeholder engagement, right? So are we listening and how do we listen to the students and families and look at that? So I'm just excited for that process because I think that's where the meaningfulness of this will come in is designing what it is our community would like us to provide students. So, um, and as far as board as what you can um, help support us through, I think is um, the opportunity to provide you updated information and for you to be able to ask questions and help guide us through what you would like to know more of um, so that we can be providing you the information you would need as we look at this, not only short term, but long term as well. So my question is in terms of, um, first of all, this is, Great. I mean, it's a great start. I feel like it's been a long time coming, um, and I agree. At some point, elementary needs to be pulled into this as well. But let's start here. Um, in terms of overall, do you do you have any picture of what type of long-term timelines you've got on this in terms of goals? We already know there's a gap. There's an obvious gap between um, the middle school and the high school. That's why we have performance issues with the freshmen coming in, right? So we're trying to fix that. Do you have any goals in terms of how long do you see before we'll be able to get to something tangible and measurable with results with our students going from eighth grade into the freshman year? Because that's the one where it seems to be the biggest issue. And a follow-up to that is, is there, I don't see anything on the matrix here. Are there considerations being given to anything behavioral at the middle school level that might be creating a ripple as they move from the middle school into the high school? Yeah, those are solid questions. So I think about that eighth grade to ninth grade experience. I know the, the high school is starting those conversations with the freshman academy, and I know the middle school is engaged in that as well. And I think what we really need to drill into is what is the specific evidence that we know of um, as to who might be having um, the need for more supports, if it's behaviorally, social, emotional, or academically. Um, how do we know our students are in the middle school and what do they need more of? to feel that they're ready to be successful as a freshman at that high school for that transition year because there's a, there's a significant change developmentally um, and emotionally um, and academically during that time period. So I think it's really looking at and hearing and listening to the students about what truly are those opportunities for us to say how might we do it better and, and what are we doing really well. Um, so I think behaviorally that is wrapped into the social emotional piece. So we did engage in some of those conversations already this week um, about how our students speak to us through behavior, right? Sometimes it's visible, sometimes it's invisible. So what are those social emotional behavioral supports um, that we need to um, support? And the middle school had great conversations about advisory um, and the intent of the advisory and the very um, purposeful um, and proactive programming that they're doing with counselors going into advisory times to provide those grade level skills for students. And so we'll be looking at that um, and asking what is that scope and sequence, so to speak, or what is that alignment for those skills to be both proactive in social, emotional, behavioral supports throughout our entire system um, and not just middle school. And that will provide the opportunity to go, okay, so even fourth to fifth grade, what are those social, emotional, behavioral support skills that we can offer students to help them all be successful? And I'm going to just draw just a line over to Scott's question, kind of attached to yours, when he asked um, what you can do to support. And I think the, the biggest thing is to have an open mind and to challenge um, what are maybe commonly held beliefs. So. My heart is racing right now after I heard you say that there's an eighth grade gap and that we have to fix that when they get to ninth grade. I don't know what data you're looking at, and I'd like to have a, maybe a different conversation because uh, I don't know if I agree with that. And that's why we're doing a 512. So the whole idea that when kids come here, there's a problem there, that'd be like me saying, well, our kids are this way because it's the elementary school. We're not passing the buck. We're having a 512 conversation. 
and we're talking about where we're at right now. So I don't agree with the, that the, we have to fix our eighth grade schools going to the ninth grade. Um, I think we have to look at the system this way. So. Are you serving all students, parents and staff, or select? All. And how are you going to get to the students in classes or yes, sending it at home? Yes, we might have to um, come up with some creative ways because one of the things we'll be monitoring with the panorama and, and schools have had incredible success with that tool because it's a tool that you can use for a, a wide variety um, of survey input. Um, but we know that surveys are not the only way. Um, and so who are we hearing from through the survey and how will we offer that to students while they're in a classroom? Right, so we can share how important this message is for their survey and their input and how this will help us design um, for their experience and for their, you know. But those students would be part of the focus groups too. The yeah. Community ones too. So yep. I, I, would, I would like to do round tables if I could mm -hmm. um, because I think kids will tell you maybe more than they, that's, you know, I guess we'd have to figure that yep. out to make sure it's representative of, you know, and grades and, yeah. And I always think it's important to offer it um, you know, to who would want to be involved as well, um, to make sure that people have equitable access to participate and give voice. So I think depending upon, you know, how much um, information we're getting, we may need to do more of one thing or another to make sure we're getting the solid feedback. So that's where the timeline um, may adjust a little bit too, because we don't want to rush that process of that feedback. Um, so. We want to make sure that we're getting the information we need to make solid programmatic decisions because these opportunities don't come around very often, right? To really look at the system as a whole and then start with middle school and see how it connects with high school. So. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. And so we'll figure out when in December, you know, setting up a meeting to do that. Okay, so we will move into health and safety measures. All right, so I'm uh, bringing this one to the board first as a discussion, and if the board so chooses to move it to, uh, move parts of it or some of it to action, um, to kind of give an overview, uh, we've had questions come up about clarifying just with regard uh, specifically um, how long do we stay in masking? And that's one thing that as we look back through that resolution that once we moved to masking, we weren't essentially all that clear about if when the number drops below a threshold point, how long are we going to stay? Is it the next day? Is it a certain amount of time? So that's the gist of this. So the the slide that I have up now is just starting with, in the original resolution, you know, we started with masking uh, two-year-olds through eighth grade, and then as of October 11th, we moved to 12th grade. So now we've got all of our students um, in masks. And that's where we've kind of had some of the questions uh, resurface is, again, how long do you stay? And so you'll see that under current timeline specifics, I've added that bottom recommended addition, which simply says face covering levels will remain in place for a minimum of two weeks from the time that that 14 day per 10,000 case drops below a threshold set point number. Simply meaning at this point, right, so 50 is the number for the high school if it drops to 49. What we're trying to, to avoid is we go, we go out mask one week and then in mask the next week and out mask because that's been the concern on the other hand that people brought up. So um, it's a great question and it's been it's it's been a great uh, question to be raised. How do you clarify this? Because I know people have questions about what's that going to look like. So this would be my recommendation. Like I said, um, I don't have this is really the discussion. Um, and if you so choose and would want to move it to an action, then that would be my recommendation to make a change or adjust this to make a change. But I wanted to make it clear that this has come up as a, as a point of questioning from the community, and so I thought we should address it. Yeah, thank you. And I think one of the confusing points is that in our original resolution, we said that um, the, the decision would remain in place for a minimum of two weeks. 
And so then the question was, did that mean that two weeks from when masks go on, they will be on for at least two weeks, or was that related to once the number drops? And so trying to clarify that. Um, so do board members have comments on this, questions, concerns that they would like to discuss? Lisa. <laughs> Um, I had not thought about it until I saw this in our board book document that it was coming forward because my understanding, not, not that it was uh, clearly communicated, was that we would have two weeks of data before we switched out. And that, and then we went to C on the call, it, it, we could go to a more Levels could be increased on a shorter interval. So we did not need two weeks of data to increase, but we needed two weeks of data to decrease. So my original understanding aligns with the recommended addition. I, I can appreciate that it was, could be read a different way, but that recommended addition it, it aligns with what I thought we were saying. My question is, uh, first of all, I would change it from the time, the 14 day, I would say from the date, the 14 day. And then I would also uh, want clarification on the face covering levels will remain in place for a minimum of two weeks. So that infers that it could be longer than two weeks. Why? So let's, let's at least discuss why could that be longer than two weeks? And if it does need to go longer than two weeks, who makes that decision? Is that something that the board has to do? Or is that something that we have empowered the superintendent to do? I think it's the lab that the superintendent is empowered to do that. But maybe that's just my understanding. So I'd like to just talk about that a little bit. I agree with that. Um should be in place for two weeks unless specified per building or by superintendent because I don't think that we should have an emergency meeting to increase the two weeks unless the numbers are spiking up again and then we have to go back another day or you know restart the date for the 14 days because then if we have inconsistencies um, one time it was two weeks one time it was four weeks one time it was three and a half we don't have that consistent data of why we chose that. So would one of our concerns be, I am curious about the, um, the minimum of two weeks as well. Like Lisa, I originally, the intent behind it, I saw the two weeks and um, I agree that that's where I saw our original intent. Um, but if we say a minimum of two weeks is the thought, Let's say we fall to 47, and then we're at 46, and then at week two we're at 49, and we're seeing ourselves eke up. I assume that's where we're saying a minimum of two weeks because we're not going to say, well, it's been two weeks, but by next week we're going to have to hit that 50 threshold again. I'm assuming that's where that's coming from, but I would like clarification. That's the intent of leaving it at a minimum, is if you're seeing a trend go up again, the, the idea is to not be jumping in and out of a, of a masking, unmasking. So I think your example is exactly what we're talking about. This is just a logistics question. So the data comes out, if I'm, I think you might see it the night before. I feel like sometimes we hear about it maybe before. It comes out on a Friday. Very late yeah, it's been Thursday. coming out right away, either late Friday night or early, or late, late Thursday, Thursday night or, or early, early Friday. Friday morning. Okay, so it would be, I, I, I like that example, just because it helps me understand what you might see. So we might see something on a Thursday that brings us below a threshold, any threshold. It might be a threshold at the middle school, and then, and then we would see something the next Friday. We would take action. Action would be taken. We would take no action actually be taken to start counting and the next Friday there would be more data so that's still one week so we need a third data point 
Is that what that, that's what saying two weeks means? Because you would find out some information that would move you below a threshold. You would start counting. You'd get a data point. You would continue counting. You'd get a third data point right at the end of that 14 days. Mm -hmm. And then you would potentially be in a position to declare something first starting, then following after the weekend. Yeah. I'm saying this out loud just to understand how it Brian, you look very thoughtful. Are you guys getting data points every day? Uh, how often are you getting data points? I only get a data point every Friday. Okay, so you get a data point every Friday. So, so that gets at least as three data points. Okay, I see where you're going with that. All right, so my question is, so we set this thing up on a 14 day, and you're talking about this trending. So by that same token, does that mean if it goes, uh, I'm picking numbers out of the air to try to get to 50. So let's say it goes 60, and then it goes 55, and then it goes 50. Okay, so technically, you're still above, right? But now you're, getting, now you're going to the second week, now you're trending the other way. You see what I'm saying? So does it work in reverse? So if you say, this trend is showing me we're about to go back over 50 again, so we're gonna keep it in place. Does it work in reverse too? We're trending down, so we're not going to put it back in place. Follow what I'm saying? Does it work backwards as well, or only forwards? Well, in the example you gave, that third data point would still be above, so that would be the start of your two weeks. Right, but, went the data, below that. but the example Lisa gave, we were below 50, but we were trending up, but at that third data point, it was 49 trending up, and you were saying, well, that's why we say minimum, because in the next week we would because we're at 49 and we're trending up. Yeah, you it's, wouldn't trigger, it'd be like what, how we went into masking this time. You wouldn't, in that instance, you wouldn't, you wouldn't move into masking until you hit that 50 again. Okay, so you hit that 50 and then... So then you'd stay there for two weeks. And you stay there for two weeks, even if you're over 50. Well, you'd stay there if you're over 50. No, I'm saying if you were not in un un masks, and then data point one of week three, you hit 50, would you stay there? With no mask for two weeks then. No, you no. moved to mask because you'd hit that threshold. So, okay, so, but, that's the, but, where, the, but the reverse isn't true. No, so if you look at the current timeline specifics, point C says levels may be increased at a shorter interval. So once we hit the number 50, then masks go on. So it's not until we drop below that number that the two week count begins. And we wanna make sure that case numbers are below that threshold for two weeks before we remove masks. So we're not going masks on, masks off, masks on, masks off and confusing family, confusing students, confusing teachers, and just making it incredibly burdensome. Right. No, I got that part. I'm just saying, so let's say the masks come off. It sounds like, okay, so the masks are on, you're saying we can go further than two weeks if we see something trending. If it's the opposite, and no one's wearing masks, and then you get to that third week, and again, you don't want to go flipping back and forth, right? But what you're saying is, if the masks are back on, you might flip sooner than the other way around. Right. Okay, my understanding is if, you not, if we're not in masking at any level, we're watching the threshold, nobody's counting weeks. Got it. Nobody's counting weeks, we're not masking. All we're doing Got it. is watching for the threshold to be passed. When the threshold is passed, guidance is given. Got it. The only time you're watching it is when it's, when you're nearing the chance where you might come out of mass into an unmasked condition. And when you talk about, the, when you talk about the three data points, you're talking about the day that the data comes out that would move us below so, so we're in mass right now. The day it would come out where it puts us below, that's our first data point. That's, we know that's going to be on a Friday. So then the following, so then we start counting on Monday. So then the next Friday we get our second data point. Then we go to the next week, we start on Monday. We get our third data point on Friday. And then the first time that a change could be made would be that following number. Mm -hmm. okay. What about uh, we've got some major holidays coming up? What about do we want to give any thought to that around what about over Thanksgiving? What about over 
uh, Christmas break. What does that look like coming back, whether we're in masks or not in masks? Do we still stick to the same numbers? I just think we stick to the guidelines that we have. I mean, I know it's risky, but I think we can't change it up just for, I mean, people go on, people go on vacations and, you know, I think that I, I would not like to switch it up just for holidays or breaks or anything like that. Yeah, I'm certainly not. Yeah. yeah. I'm certainly yeah. not proposing that. I'm just bringing it up as a yeah, discussion. Yeah, but it's something to think about because, you know, the well, threshold. Well, it's, it's, it's coming up and I want to be thorough in mm -hmm. our discussion. So. I still don't like that we say a minimum. I think we should need to be more specific so that people understand if we are going to a third week, why, or, speci or specified by superintendent or something. Just so people are, it's clear why we're doing it. I'm not knowing what the exact reason would be, I'd be hesitant to start laying out those specifics I think that's why you put something like minimum in there so that people know for sure you're going to be in there two weeks um, I think it as we get through that that's where the it becomes incumbent to be communicating with folks you know and, and as it moves as you, if you were in that situation then you you would be communicating out okay we hit this first data point we're we're now gonna if we stay below two weeks we're going to look at shifting masks and that next week we'd repeat that, let people know that's what we're looking at and continue in that Raider update every Friday, letting people know what the numbers are and what our counts are. That said, that just, we need to be careful how we're wording this because even if we say from the date the 14 per 10,000 case drops below, well that's on a Friday. So we don't start counting until the following Monday when we go two weeks. So I don't want anybody thinking that, well, the number went down on Friday. So the first week Friday, that's one week. The second week Friday, oh, that's two weeks. And now Friday, I'm not showing up in a mask or whatever. We just need to be very intentional with the wording here so there's no ambiguity about the meaning. I don't have a suggestion for what that looks like, but I think we need to be very clear. We can go to Monday following the day. And refresh my memory on the entire original document because I, I hear your point, Becky, about making it clear that this is a superintendent's decision only because scheduling an emergency meeting and holding an emergency meeting is is not responsive. It's not. It's a, it's not a good way to to run this particular ship uh, in this case. But my recollection, again, of the entire health and safety guidance was after our action in August was our set point, and then we gave this criteria to the superintendent to take action. So that's already embedded in the larger document. It didn't make this slide, but it's embedded in the larger document. That's correct. Yeah, and I fully support Becky's idea of putting it in the superintendent's purview because he's talking to the administrators. He's got his fingers on the pulse of each of our schools and the numbers that we're getting and how it's trending and talking to other schools and all of these pieces of information that we don't have. So if something needs to happen, I want him to have that have that authority to, to do so without pulling us back together. And since Superintendent McDowell, you mentioned the Raider update, I do just want to say to the community, the Raider update is something that goes out to all of the families in the district. It is also on our website and it is posted to our Facebook page every week. So if you are interested in following the information that is sent out and the updates that are being sent out, that this is a great way for you to stay updated on that as well. So do board members have any other questions, comments, concerns, otherwise? Um, is there a motion to move this to an action item? So moved. 
Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? We have the motion in place with the revised wording on the recommended action or the recommended addition. So based on what I heard, um, it would read face covering levels will remain in place for a minimum of two weeks beginning the Monday following the date which the 14 day per 10,000 rate drops below a threshold set point number. Beautiful. All right, I'm seeing nodding heads. So with that, all those in favor of moving this to an action item say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, motion carries, so we will see this later. Bond projects. And so just as a note, uh, the agenda was posted on Friday. Our facilities committee meeting was yesterday. So there has been, so now the updates have been added based on the facilities committee that occurred yesterday. Uh, so we did want to give an update on where we are with bond projects as um, as people know we're coming into the final stretch of of what can be spent and, and what money is left and so the facilities uh, group has been working hard to uh, try and get in front of the whole board uh, topics for discussion so we can come up with what the final projects would be that we would be taking on as part of the bond project update. So just to uh, give some background, and Jen Suber, correct me if I misstep anywhere, please, but uh, bringing some history to this, the total, you can see the total bond revenue there was a little over 48 million. Um, the amount that we've expended since September of this year is uh, just under 39 million, and so we have uh, a little, less than 12 million left and of that the amount that is considered uncommitted towards projects so we've got 11 million total but we've got some projects that are in process and those have committed dollars to them uh, so there's a little over 3 million that is considered uncommitted at this point meaning the board hasn't taken formal, formal action on what those projects would be so the deadline and this is important and uh, again having you understand why are we bringing this now is we have to meet a final deadline of spending our bond project dollars by March of 2023. And so when you look at timelines for everything from planning phase, design phase, bidding, um, timing out when construction can actually take place and when we can do some of this construction because we're bound by a school year in summers, uh, we really need to have um, our spending um, allocated by November of 2022 in order to meet that final deadline. So uh, this is a um, potential projects from the facilities committee. So the facilities committee, as they meet, as, as you've seen on the uh, facility committee uh, reports that come out for the board meetings, all the different types of projects that have made the list, have moved up and down on the list, uh, have, have changed in dollar amounts. The facilities committee spent time this week, as Chair Waits discussed, uh, coming up with what would be a priority list based on one the dollars that are left and the projects that are potentially in the hopper right now and so the list that you have on the slide is that list you'll see that on the top we have that little over three million contingency remaining and then you'll see the projects listed on the left side the middle column is the projected cost for each one of those projects and on the right hand side if you subtract from the three million working down you'll see what's remaining if those projects would go into play and so at this point in time um, we can walk through those projects as far as what the scope of them are and we do have members of the facilities committee obviously here we've got jen suber here so that the, the full board could ask questions about what and all that that entails yeah just going back to the back to the last page, so we were at 11.8 11 11 million remaining. Uncommitted is about three million. Do we have a built-in contingency on that 11.8 million that we've spent? Is there a, con a contingency amount, a plus minus 10 percent, or? 
Yeah, normally it's somewhere between, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, 10 and 25% on each project is the contingency set aside factor. And that's covered for? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that uncommitted remaining Oops, is, sorry. is projects that have been completed and the contingency that remains from those. So it's, it's actual remaining. It's probably the most conservative way to consider this. And I think it's important to point out that was one of the things that Jen Subert's been working on with WOLD, even in this last week, was to go back through each one of those projects that are in process and really try to nail down, do we still think we need that contingency for that project, or is it over under, or is there anything else going into it? So I'll work down the list, and like I said, stop at any time. The ALC project, um, this is one that we've brought up uh, one or two times. Uh, we have spent, if you remember back at the end of last year, what our plan was, was to wait until this fall when we had students back in school. And we spent uh, time with both students and staff over at the C-Pod, first floor C-Pod of the high school with WOLD and we walked through CPOD and tried to get their ideas about what would this look like, uh, sound like, feel like, uh, if we were to move the ALC into the CPOD. And so there were about eight students from the current ALC that came over and spent a good hour, hour and a half with the architects, uh, with Jen Subert, myself, um, really talking through what are their wants and needs for what a space would look like um, if they were going to have a space at the ALC. And so um, they had some pretty great ideas. We, they even provided a drawing that they brought to us. Um, and that, uh, that conversation led to an initial sketch drawing uh, that included things like they wanted their own entrance. And there's a way on the seed pod on the uh, northwest side where there's an entrance there that they could they could have that. Um, the group felt like they wanted to be able to enter the building without seeing the main entrance of the building. They wanted their own space. They wanted to have the flexibility of staying inside of that C pod if that's what they wanted to do their entire experience or the opportunity to go out. So for example, uh, we had kids tell us that what would be great is if they could be there early, attend Spark, and then come to the ALC or if they wanted to take one of the industrial tech classes, they could do that. Um, we had others that were more hesitant and more anxiety laden, and they're like, I just wanna make sure I can be in here and I don't have to interact or see or do anything else than ALC. And that led us into a conversation about, it really needs to look different, it needs to sound different, it needs to feel different for us, um, because we do have kids that have high anxiety, and some of the kids that, that go to ALC currently, um, go there because they didn't have a good experience. So they didn't want that experience at that physical plant. Um, and uh, Todd Levos was great about bringing a couple of those students over as part of this. Um, and they were really anxious when we first started talking and that definitely calmed down as they were able to talk through what it could be and, and what the experience could be. Um, the staff came over and the staff talked us through what their needs were, things like they know they want four classrooms, they know that they need small breakout rooms, they know that they need a common space, they need a kitchen, um, they need their own bathrooms in that area. Um, they really need uh, places where the staff can meet together. Um, they needed a place where it was very, um, from the, where you entered that ALC, very visible to see every part of the ALC. Um, places where the school psychologist, the school nurse, any of the auxiliary services could come to the ALC where kids didn't have to go outside of that C pod to receive any of those services. And so um, Sal Bagley, one of the architects that we worked with, was able to do an initial design that uh, was shared with Todd Levos, just making all of that stuff come together. And that's where we sit at this point. That was the intentional plan. We didn't. We knew that what we needed to do was to get the kids in there. We needed to get the staff in there, get their ideas. We needed to get an initial sketch. But at the same time, we didn't want to share that initial sketch too far until we got to this spot to have this conversation. Um, because that team's going to want to go back and refi refi refine that sketch and make sure it truly is. 
what we really need to do is understand as a board, um, because the other thing that the sketch allowed us to do was to get that estimated cost. And so really where we would be with this project would be asking the board, are you, are you okay approving that approximate 1.4 million to do the work for the ALC and move the ALC into that building? Reasons other than kids and the staff, um, some concerns that come up. Um, one, we know that when we have an opportunity to get out of a lease space, that's probably a, almost always a good thing. That would allow us to do that. Um, and that's a little over $30,000 a year that we spend leasing a building uh, for the current ALC. Um, a concern that comes up is back to the kids with the anxiety and what will, what will that do? In talking with Todd Levos, we think that, that we have a pretty good opportunity here because of where we can locate the ALC and truly keep it a separate part of that building for those that want it. We also know that by utilizing that C space, we're able to double the capacity, and that's been a concern. We currently have a waiting list of over 20 kids because the current ALC building can't house any more kids in it. And so there is a, there's a trade-off. Um, there, there is a potential that a student with anxiety, we might have to work with that student and figure something out. On the flip side, there's an opportunity for us to service more of our Hastings kids in a bigger setting than what we currently can do to, the, to almost double its size. Uh, lastly, um, we do share staff between the ALC and the high school. And so this puts staff in the same location um, as the high school and creates that um, as a little bit easier process. So I've talked a lot about the ALC. I don't know if it sparks questions. Um, I know this is a topic that it concerns some, it excites others. It, this is where we are with that project. We, we think we've done due diligence in trying to get enough feedback from students and staff on this um, and able to find a solution that would work and keep more Hastings kids in an ALC. Um, and do it and put a cost to it. Yeah, so I would say since this is a lot of information about the ALC, I think it's best to address questions and concerns with this particular project just now as we've talked about it. I know as a board member, uh, one of my biggest concerns with moving the ALC to the high school has been for those kids who have left the high school for a particular reason. Um, I will say at the facilities committee meeting yesterday as we talked about the different input students have so while there were only eight or nine kids who did the walkthrough that drawing that was come up with was actually come up with by a much larger group of students um, in trying to come up with this design what do they feel comfortable with and the engineers at Wold have really been working to support um, those needs and those concerns and after hearing uh, the input that they gave, uh, I feel far more comfortable uh, with this than I had before. I guess, and, and this will become clear as we get into this, I'm having a hard time picturing what this looks like. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's great. I'm excited that we can service more of our students. That's a, that's a great thing. The sights and sounds of an ALC are probably, I haven't spent a lot of time in, in there, but they're probably different than our normal high school sights and sounds, you know, with bells and, and all of that. So will, will they be more isolated with that? And then also another door, another way into, you know, another way into the high school, we have to look at security on that as well. So yes to both. Uh, that was part of the whole, that's why I kind of I shared with the, what it'll sound like, feel like, look like. Um, yeah, that actually came up from the kids. And the, for all practical purposes, the C pod would become its own entity um, uh, where it wouldn't have the bells ringing. It wouldn't have the intercoms unless the teachers turned the intercom on uh, for when they needed to do safety drills, things like that. It would have, um, dimmable lights, it, it, would, it would really be its own experience for those kids. As far as when you, if you can imagine entering CPOT the way that this looks right now, 
uh, actually one of the entry doors would go away. So there would only be one entrance in and out to CPOD. And then that glass area would, whether it would be frosted or be covered, so you wouldn't be able to, it wouldn't be fishbowl in, fishbowl out. It would be its own piece. Um, and then the bathrooms would actually sit just on the inside of that. So they would, they would have their own access to their own bathrooms in that space. So it would, it would really be its own, own entity inside of a, it'd be a building inside of a building is what it would be. Just one more thing I wanted to, to ask about is the need for a kitchen. Is that for training or what is, what is the, what's the idea behind the kitchen? I, I know I don't have a great understanding of what that would be. Around. Yes and. Um, it is, from what we understand, um, the kitchen, the current kitchen, the current ALC has a kitchen. Um, so while there isn't a lot of current cooking or things like that that go on in it, I think it would be more like a kitchen at type piece where they do need, because they do art and they do science um, and um, they do, uh, the kids bring their lunches, they, they heat their lunches up there, they need to clean dishes, things like that. It would be more of that. I probably shouldn't call it a, a kitchen as a full kitchen. Um, I think they're thinking refrigerator, sink, microwave. I don't know that it would have a stove in it uh, because they don't. They don't do that part. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you answered quite a bit of, or quite a few of my questions. Um, I do wonder though, will they be on a different schedule than the high school? I, I'm just thinking about the access and, you know, like Kelsey had brought up, students that go to the ALC have left the high school for various reasons. And if one of those triggers is that, you know, they are at the high school where they were purposeful in leaving, are they gonna run into their peers that go to the high school? Is that gonna cause more anxiety? So I, I worry about that piece and, and making sure that we can kind of stagger the schedule so that we can minimize any of that concern. Um, and then, and then maybe this is a dumb question, but like, you know, access to the gym, access to, oh, okay, still on. Um, I like the idea of, you know, the, the teachers being able to move in between the ALC and the high school and that it's its own little space. Um, I do worry that it's going to become a little bit more isolated and my kids might not venture out a little bit more too, but, but they're there to learn too. So, um. It has its pros and its cons. My, my biggest issue is making sure that we do everything that we can to minimize that anxiety in the, in the children. So the kids spoke to that when we had them there. They were actually pretty excited about, from that standpoint, so the ability to get outside. So right now they really don't have a lot of places to go uh, in the location that they're at. Whereas here they'd have the, they felt they'd have the whole campus to explore. Um, in terms of exercise, things like that. They would have the access to the gyms. Um, we could look at uh, tweaking schedules. I think that would that type of planning comes down to after we make a decision and if this is what we're doing, then that's something that we have to work out with uh, between Todd Levos and the high school because one, we've got some shared teachers and so we work on those schedules. But I think the majority of those students end up working on a little different schedule anyways, so there shouldn't be too much conflict there. Are there any other questions or comments on the ALC before we move on to the other projects on the list? All right, I'm not seeing any. Yeah. All right, the other ones are fairly straightforward. Uh, the high school lecture hall seating is in disrepair. And uh, we, as we go through these things, uh, you'll remember that uh, we've, we've since last year met with all of the principals and talked about things that are still in need. And the high school lecture was one of those things where the tables are bent, they're uh, in disrepair, the seats are kind of in disrepair, not all functioning, and so you can see the price there. It's 
pretty straightforward. It's taking the tables and the chairs out, having new tables and chairs put into that high school lecture hall across from the main office up there. So the cost of that is $140,000. I don't know if there's any questions on that one, but that's that project. Can I safely assume that the refurbishment will be a little bit more user friendly to people of different shapes and sizes? <laughs> yes, that oh. is the plan. <laughs> that is more easily accessible. How's that? <laughs> All right, I'll keep moving then. Uh, the high school uh, baseball drainage field, and I do have a picture for this one just to bring everybody up to speed. So uh, in this picture, you'll see where the green lines are. That's the uh, left field outfield. And there's a low spot there that does not drain well. Um, they're not quite sure exactly. There are assumptions as to why it's not draining well. Um, could be slope. It could be the fact that we have drain tiles crushed. But essentially what we're looking at is doing um, going in there and making sure we understand for sure are the drain tiles crushed is there other stuff that needs to be done and then you'll see that there are red dots one of the ideas if the drain tile is intact and just not working and it's a landscape type problem they may have to do what's called vertical tile which then actually catches the water and then leads it to those horizontals so it's a big project but you'll also see that it's the reason that there is such a range there is because we won't know until we dig into it. The $200,000 is that extreme of we got to rip everything up, put in the vertical drain tile. But right now, that uh, left field of that baseball field does not drain, and we end up with unusable space on our, on our varsity fields. So that's why that project is there. And that's also why there's kind of a range. We'll find out when we get it. Well, I was wondering too, because that comma, if that was 20,000 oh, or 200,000? No, it is, it is so 200. It's 200. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. I missed it. And so that's basically if the drainage is completely collapsed. Um, but it's very unlikely that it's the whole like drainage bit and that there's a section, but just in case. And it looks like you've also accounted for the full 200,000 as we've gone through this. Correct. We always uh, take it, the numbers as the most conservative. So then the next one is the middle school track replacement. And depending upon how much of conversation over the last two years people have been involved with this, this has been something where it's looked at uh, replacing the entire track, replacing uh, less than the entire track, not doing anything. Um, what was discovered here was that in order to replace the entire track, you would have to actually dig up the base and replace about four feet of the base in order to get to the spot where we'd be able to put the track down and then the rubberized actual track on top of that. That came in at well over a million dollars, and so the facilities team has come back and said, at this point, it probably makes more sense to replace the rubberized track um, and get that done, and that comes in just under five hundred thousand dollars. How long does that normally last? Do you remember what they said, Jen? Well, this is where. It and I'm not going to be able to answer that question specifically, but this is the values-based conversation because if you wanted it to be, you know, like we recent, relatively recently redid the high school track and that foundation was how you would design it, um, you're going to get decades of wear. So what we don't have at the middle school is that foundation, right? But we have a track that's been there for decades and has not had... I mean, it's not in great repair because the surface has just been the surface, but we haven't seen substantial geomechanical shifting and subsidence. So there is a level of risk that says, all right, we're not going to commit a million and a half to a middle school track. And we're not going to allow it to degrade to the place where we can't use it anymore. 
what we're proposing here from the facilities perspective is we'll, we'll resurface it and assume that the foundation that's worked to, to now is going to hold. We could be super wrong. And, it, you know, we could be back in five years and go, wow, that was just a terrible idea. Um, but again, we have decades in place on that site. So we're proposing that we accept that risk um, to maintain a facility that that we heard, because the initial question was, how much does that really get used? What we heard back from Trent and the community and Pinecrest and the middle school is that it is used. It's definitely an asset. Not <laughs> no, actually, I was going to say thank you for reading my mind <laughs> and understanding what I was getting to. No, that's, that's good information. <laughs> and I think that's the answer we even got from Gold, because even if we, to Lisa's point, if you dig that up, what we don't know is, will it shift? Well, it's a fair admission on Lisa's part, because I can tell you from coaching track the last few years, it is shifting. So when you redo it, it's going to keep shifting. And I can tell you specific spots in the track that are going to keep shifting. So it's going to happen again. It's just a matter of how long it takes for it to happen again. Mm -hmm. It's going to, because the base is compromised. So it's just a matter of how long it takes and how much time we get out of it. It's kind of like trying to get a few more miles out of an older car if we have to buy a new one. So I get it. Yeah, and, and it's, this is very similar to the conversation we had about the middle school tennis courts 10 years ago. Because we have an asset of tennis courts at our middle school that you just can't probably reasonably expect to spend as much money on as your high school varsity courts. And that's, it, it's a very similar conversation in that sense. We don't want to lose it, completely lose it by ignoring it. Um, but we've got to, we've chosen over the past years to find these middle ground responses. So the last project on there is the high school team locker room privacy improvements. And so this has been a discussion over the last couple of years. Uh, it's part of the privacy bathrooms discussion. Uh, they've got the drawings done. Um, they've met once again with uh, the high school team, uh, the administrative team, uh, Trent Hansen, really going through that. And so at this point in time, that just under, well, 856,000 um, is where they're at. Uh, for those high school privacy improvements. Yeah, and just with a couple notes of this, what we talked about is it says that minus 57, but we expect that to most likely be covered through contingency as other projects are completed. But what we have said is that if it doesn't, since this is the lowest on our tier, what our plan would be is say we only have $750,000 left in the bond. Then we say, okay, we know that uh, these improvements are important to you. Your budget is now $750,000. What are you going to do with that money towards your goal? Um, so that is the facilities plan with this. What happens if we get to a point where we have some small amount, I mean, not small, but smaller than $3 million, some amount of money left over at the end that we don't have identified and we hit November 2022, where did, what happens? Yep, so we have, um, there's, there are two, two things we are watching. One is we know that um, as we move through even this budget adjustment conversation, we have technology needs. We still have um, technologies identified in the bond as things that we can spend money on and we know that we have technology improvements um, and so that would be the first thing we would plan on is uh, to bring that to the board if we got to that point in time and said it looks like we're gonna have more contingency than we thought so we'd like to spend money on these technology improvements um, if we had a lot more than that the other thing that we've looked at is the potential of those uh, building signs in front of our buildings, looking at, at updating some of the signs in front of the buildings. But technology would be the first thing on the list. Some of these are pretty big projects. Are we at any risk with resourcing these to get them 
done in the time frame that we need them to be done at, at this time, that you know of at this time? That's why we need to, need to start this process right now is because we've scoped out with wool the potential, not only the timelines, but again, because we're working in and out of school years and some of these projects can't be done. Like for example, the ALC, we could probably start that before the end of the school year because we can move some people out of that space and they could start that. But uh, lecture hall seating, that that we got to schedule when kids aren't going to be there, um, whether that's in a school year, uh, whether that's in summer school. Also, that project depends upon when exactly we can get those materials in. So some, you got the ordering going on, and just that whole lead time. So now is when we need to make this decision on what are the final projects. So. So just to add on to that question, Scott, because Wold has been working on the background of these and the, the team locker room privacy pieces, we've already advanced pretty far on the PE locker room privacy improvement. So, you know, developing this, the spec documents for this is not substantial. They're anticipating most of these would go out, uh, the ones that would have to go out for a bit are gonna go out that November, December time frame, December probably. So like this coming months, which puts us in a place of one, knowing if we get a really unfavorable bid, you know, we'll obviously have to do something, whatever something is in that sense, we don't know yet. Um, and we'll also hear what's happening with, you know, delivery of bathroom fixtures or whatever the case might be that could get in your way. And we'll know that shortly if we, you know, advance forward to approving it. So I guess what we'd be, this is kind of on the same lines as the last conversation, what we would want to do as a, or have you do as a board is move one or all of these projects for approval. I haven't, looked at the most recent, I haven't looked at the most recent agenda. Is this is this in there as an action item? I did not put it in there as an okay. action item. Sorry. I didn't want to make an assumption as far as... Okay. Thank you. So I'm always curious when we do priorities like this. Okay, this is above the line. What what What's below the line? What's the number one and two things that didn't make the list? So um, we looked at lighting improvements, so changing lighting to LEDs across the buildings. And then, so that was five different ones. Um, and then we also looked at grounds improvements. And ultimately, as we discussed at the facilities meeting, we said we wanted to focus the bond dollars on those things that would most impact students' daily um, environment. Uh, that lighting one in particular, I wonder if that wouldn't fall under our long-term facility maintenance. There it was a there was a little bit of discussion about that, um, and we're going to kind of do a test run on that mm -hmm. because we are doing some LED light replacement in the district office, and we'll submit that through the uh, Department of Ed for consideration. I, my understanding is that there is some language that's specific about lighting not qualifying unless you're at the end of life of the fixture. So it's just a question of figuring that out. Um, we definitely said, you know, those are important projects because they put us in a good environmental position and a good cost savings position, the lighting specifically. Um, and they're relatively large. You know, it's like two and a half million dollars to get the high school switched over. So we weren't really in a place to bring those very far forward. Um, but it'll be interesting to see because the district office light, lights that are being replaced are the same uh, era as the high school lights, for example. So it's kind of studying that and hoping to find out more. So with that, are there any more questions or comments about these projects, or do we have a motion to move these projects for approval as an action item? Second. Any discussion on the motion? 
just a thank you to the facilities committee for all your work on this because I know that it was a lot of work and a lot of hours put into all of all of this and everything that has come before this too. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, we can wait until Brian comes back to to take a vote. Um, yeah, it, I will say it does feel nice to be at the end of the bond. This has been <laughs> this has been a long journey. <laughs> It has, but look at everything we've done. Mm -hmm. Look at the list of stuff that has gotten done. It's, some of it is very visible and some of it is almost invisible to the community, but yeah, very important stuff. And we got very lucky with our beginning projects, uh, just with where the construction environment was and what how our costs came in far under budget, and it really let us move other, other things forward. All right, so we have, just to catch up, we have a motion on the table to move the approval of these to an action item. So, and we finished discussion, unless you have any questions on the motion. Okay, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Oppose, same sign. Motion carries. We will see this one again later. Budget adjustment update. Okay, well, we'll keep going here. Um, so just a, uh, a reminder that we've been working on this guiding change document for budget adjustments for this year. The items in yellow are things that we talked last at our work session and have been either moved into desired results or have been modified um, based on the information that I had gotten back from people. And so, um, we had this in the packet. I don't know if there are any additional comments or conversations on this slide. I didn't get any feedback after the adjustments. So what I wanted to do tonight is just give you some updates of where we are, because that was one of the things we talked about as we moved through this, this progression, what, where we wanted to give updates to the board. So the four big topics that came out of our work session conversation were one, taking a look at middle school athletics and activities. So Carrie Gore is looking at that. The request was, can we go and see, um, find out from other districts that have moved any type of athletics out of the K-12 environment into something else? What does that look like to people? What's it feel like to people? And what's the cost benefit? Are they seeing what they thought? So Carrie Gore is running with that one and investigating that for us. From a technology committed uh, bond, we just had a little bit of that conversation you know, with the leftover dollars. So right now, uh, Missy Williams is putting together two things. It, she is putting together that cost analysis of what will it cost us on an annual basis to sustain our one-to-one um, -one initiative, as well as all of our classroom technology, so the smart boards. So she just got done meeting with a company called CDW. We use them a lot for this type of thing. Um, getting prices, she's waiting here back on a couple of the classroom sets, but she'll have options for us there, so we'll know more of what that means with regard to technology. Um, then with regard to right sizing, Jen Subert and Kathy Moen and I are working on making sure that we have all of our numbers organized, all of our staffing numbers organized. Uh, Kathy and Jen have met with principals again. We're looking at everything from specialist staffing to paraprofessional staffing, general ed staffing, special education staffing, really looking at how all that fits in our formulas so that we can get what is and isn't um, different from right now with regard to right sizing. And then finally, as you heard earlier, um, Rachel Larson is working with Missy Williams and the principals on secondary programming and really from two points. One is the request from the board was at the high school looking at not doing anything with regard to a six period day but inside of what we have are there efficiencies and effectiveness pieces we can find there which is why we're focusing just on the scheduling piece and the middle school is really working more on the programming. What does that look like? So then, just again, as a discussion item update, this is our timeline. What I do want uh, some feedback on is we originally put an optional board work session on this for the third. I don't know that we're going to have 
much more information by next week than what I've shared now. So I wouldn't recommend unless people have something they really want to talk about that we I wouldn't recommend we move forward with that one. However, I would, uh, as you heard earlier, have you consider December 1st and December 15th as options for Rachel to come back with the building principals on that scheduling. The reason I have two options on there is that December 1st, we already have that as an additional work session, assuming just generalized budget adjustments. And my concern would be that that secondary scheduling conversation is a, probably a big enough conversation to have on its own, potentially. So I don't know if you want to just keep both of them on as holds for right now, and I'll keep bringing it up as we get closer to that date, um, or if you have feedback on that. I'd prefer, I'd prefer to keep them on as holds right now, just so that we're, we're kind of ready okay. to respond. I do want to point out that I don't believe that the business meeting is on the 24th. I believe it's on the 23rd. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that Tuesday that's right. prior to um, Thanksgiving. That's right. Yeah. We changed that. Just to make sure the community's clear. We're, we're meeting on a Tuesday now. Which is very abnormal for us. Yeah. We, I'll probably come Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday just to be sure that I'm here <laughs> on the right night. I'll just start getting in the habit of swinging by. Yeah. Good Siri will remind me many times that day. Um, yeah, any other thoughts on December 1st and 15th as holds? Okay. okay. Any other questions with this one? The intent was just to give you an update on where we were. Okay. Okay. So then we'll move into policies. So we have a couple policies for first reading, and the first is school board meeting minutes. And so for this policy, um, there's been a legislative update change that has not yet taken effect, uh, but we are trying to make this change obviously before the legislative change takes effect. Uh, the change would create, um, it basically adds after minutes like slash journal that our uh, school board uh, meeting minutes need to be kept in a journal or minutes that are publicly accessible. Um, and so this is recommended for a first reading and you can see the change Kind of listed on here and again this change is due to a legislative change um, so are there any questions about this one not really much we can change about it but. okay so then we'll move into 503 student attendance and so the policy committee reviewed this policy in order to ensure it was in line with our policy 100 equity and diversity and so at this point, the way our policy is written is that a student has to be in school for at least half a day in order to attend uh, extracurricular activities. And we have added in reasons for excused absences that would not affect, impact participation in athletics and activities after school, such as college visits, um, a religious um, like if you have a religious activity, thank you. Yeah, yeah, observing something for your religion, um, but that would not impact your activities after school. And so that has been added here. So are there any questions or discussion about this policy? And you'll see there are other yellow areas. Those are because we put this policy up against the updated MSBA policy. And so the highlighted yellows are the pieces that MSBA has added into the policy in other sections. The only thing that I would point out that came in after we met as a policy committee is the high school would like, um, where it says half day, they'd like that to be uh, defined as at least four class periods. So I thought that was fairly reasonable in a seven period day. So we would see that change of, as a second reading. Okay. So are there any questions or comments about these changes. Otherwise, this will move forward for second reading next month. Okay, and then we have administrative reports. I guess I'm up again. You are? All right. I'll go quickly. I just have a few things I want to make sure that um, update the board on, and then for those folks watching, uh, just a reminder uh, that elections are next Tuesday the 2nd. However, early and absentee ballots are going
currently being accepted at the middle school main office. Um, and so uh, people I know have been voting um, every day now uh, that they've been able to. As far as an update with regard to COVID, um, while we're putting them in the radar updates, as of last Friday, our 14-day average was at 70.8 per uh, 10,000 over 14 days. And as of yesterday, or actually as of today, um, our, our cumulative counts, we've had 129 people uh, positive with COVID, made up of 17 staff, one senior from the senior center, and 111, team, 111 students. Um, so those are the cumulative numbers. On a different note, flu shots, we are offering flu shots for our staff. We had flu shots yesterday, we have flu shots tomorrow, and so uh, we've been able to get a lot of people their flu vaccine uh, and that in place, so that's been great. And along those lines, we've had, uh, we have had one blood drive and we've got one blood drive coming up. So the Community Ed held a blood drive last week, and then our High School National Honor Society is holding another blood drive on the 5th running from eight to one, and that will be in the gym at the high school. And a reminder that we are in need of people as custodians and uh, food service and paraprofessionals. And just for those, again, those people watching, food service hours generally run from two to five and three quarter hours per day. Paraprofessional hours run around uh, five and three quarter hours a day and custodian and cleaner positions run between four and eight hour shifts. If people are interested, go to the website or you can call Human Resources and we'll get you hooked up uh, because we, we need folks. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it back over. Those are really the updates for this meeting. Okay, so we have a building construction fund project update, which is slightly different than the bond projects, only because this is now kind of the aggregate of all the projects we've, we've been working on. So it is new. Be excited. <laughs> okay, so I'll just highlight a few updates since last month. Um, we had three additional projects that moved up into that completed category. They were the um, McNamara Stadium improvements, the Pinecrest Deferred Maintenance, and then the Early Childhood Improvements at the high school. So those projects are now into the completed. Um, as we look at that next sec section, the in process, we're getting really close on several of those. So the district-wide camera project, um, we paid the, the last pay up this month. So next month that'll be closed. The high school athletic field parking lot, again, that work is all completed. We're just waiting for a few final documents. And that um, same situation applies to the Tilden Deferred Maintenance and Raw. Um, the boardroom renovations, um, this area is complete too. There's just um, a little bit of paperwork that we're waiting for. So I anticipate those four projects will close really soon. And then the other update is if you look at that um, technology improvements line, we have now received the official paperwork for the E-rate, so that was about $500,000 that went back into that um, budget. So now we have still about $380,000 left to spend. And that's all I have. Do you have any questions? Does anyone have any questions for Jen? Okay, thank you very much. Next up is student enrollment. So on this one, you can see we're comparing our October of last year to October of this year for enrollment, and there was a decrease of about 63. Um, when we look at the first day of school last year to the first day of school this year, there's a decrease of about 59, so those two numbers are really close. Um, what we do then is take that October 2021 number of that 4,070 and use that to project out our end of year ADMs. Um, and that updated number is about 4,166. When I had done the adopted budget, I used 4,183. So it's a decline of about 16 kids from budget and projection. Any questions? All right, seeing none. Thank you. We can move to the facility committee 
update. <laughs> we have not been doing anything lately for like the last 24 hours. We've been doing nothing. No, I think the two things that are in there are our meetings from September and October that led us to the discussion we had earlier tonight. If anybody wants to read about that in more detail or to Scott's point, some of the um, supporting documents about which projects were just below the line or the associated uh, dollar values of them, they are in the uh, attached documents. So a little late night reading for anybody that's interested. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, community Engagement Committee. Uh, this is such a fun committee. I'm just going to throw it out there. I always do, but I just, I love this group of people. They're just so fantastic. Uh, so we met in uh, September 28th. We did decide that we are really starting to um, develop this committee coming to fruition on, on identifying what we are and how we serve the community and how we serve the district. Um, so now we're meeting once a month. It's the last Tuesday uh, of the month. Uh, yesterday we met at Tilden um, to to discuss key communicator network, uh, our key communicator network. So building a network beyond just our students, our parents, um, and then us and our you know the staff. Uh, so putting feelers out there of, you know, who who isn't receiving the Raider update that may benefit from communications from the district. Hey, this is what we're doing within the community. And, and then, you know, how can the community then help out the district? So that led into further discussion. And, and I bring up yesterday's meeting because it ties into the September 28th meeting. It was just a continuous uh, conversation about what are some tangible ideas that we can bring forward to the district and the community through this engagement committee. Uh, and we, we try to narrow it down to what can we do? It may be bringing community members into the schools to develop relationships with the students. Uh, an example is, you know, if, if there's a student that is really into finance, really good with money. Maybe we bring in somebody from it within the community that works at a bank or, or um, you know, a financial institution where they can sit down with this student and, and develop that relationship of, okay, this is what we do uh, at the bank that you may be interested in. And, um, so it's a mentorship program. It's, you know, we talked about mental health and what this, the potential for mental health and, and tackling that um, just a little bit at a time. Uh, but really it's, it's about making sure that our students feel engaged with the community, building these, um, these, these adult actors in these students' lives and vice versa too. So um, we, we'll see what happens over the next you know, year here as, as these ideas come forward and, and we can maybe look at um, actually doing this, watching this uh, come into play. Any questions for the community engagement group? Okay, then we will move on to finance committee. Uh, so the finance committee met um, on the 4th. We went through the documents talking about uh, levy, what our levy position is, with one end being in fiscal year 24, the other in fiscal year 28, and what, with that near term, you know, the fiscal year 24, uh, what options do we have around our levy, how do we communicate with our community, and um, what potential strategic use of our fund balance could come into play as we, as we start navigating those waters. So we're a little ways out from that yet, but good to think about. Uh, we went through the detail of our ending fund balance with the 2021 audit completed. Uh, we went through the variances, and those were mostly due to unfilled, position, unfilled positions within the district, which we all know the trouble that, that, we're, that school districts in general are having uh, finding finding people at this time, 
and then also our special education revenue and transportation. Uh, so those actually were unexpected adds to our fund balance. Um, went through our 2021-22 adopted budget, and then we also went through our ESSER funds that we've applied for, received, and how we've utilized them. And those are all available uh, out on the district website in the COVID-19 action plan area. Yeah, action plan area. Uh, there's a link to the nine to the September 30th update that we went through in this meeting as well. So I think I need to spruce this up a little bit because I didn't put the Timmies on this. So <laughs> I, I apologize. My my meeting minute game was off. So I will, Becky. I will get you an update for that. So the meeting just for those, the meeting attendees were our finance committee and Superintendent McDowell and Jen, and I think that was it. I think it was just the, the five of us. So, and it was right here. So. Okay, are there any questions for Scott? Then we will move into policy committee. Uh, so policy committee is actually, we're anticipating being a little bit slower and getting through some of these policies just because uh, staff is working on a number of different projects right now. And so, just so that you are aware. So we already talked about attendance as well as the school board meeting minutes. And then we also had discussed ext uh, extracurricular transportation um, where we looked at redundancies in the policy and um, a release for students who participate in Alpine skiing. But this, uh, the release isn't really part of the policy so much as you know, here's how it's put into action. Uh, you will see that we have an approval coming later for policy 402 and employment non-discrimination and this is because we thought that Trent, Trent Hansen was still listed as the Title IX coordinator. So an adjustment has been made and that will be coming forward as a recommendation for approval. Uh, we discussed uh, travel and related expenses and the committee has asked Jen to review our policy and MSBA's policy uh, in order to determine which is the most appropriate for our district because really as we look at travel and related expenses, uh, this really falls under the director of finance um, and those responsibilities rather than the policy committee in trying to set this one. And then lastly, we looked at disproportionate enrollment. And so, we currently have a policy in place for disproportionate enrollment where we have been looking at making sure uh, that we're seeing that there is not disproportionate enrollment between different demographics of students participating in particular classes. And now that we have the equity and diversity policy as well as the gender inclusion policy, the question is whether these two policies now accomplish what our initial disproportionate enrollment policy uh, was meant to accomplish. And MSBA does not have a disproportionate enrollment policy. This was something that we had created as a district. And so that is something that we can look at. So the policy committee has said we would like to kind of compare these uh, before our next meeting and have more time to sit on it and reflect and, and see what our thoughts are. So our next meeting is set for December 2nd. Any questions? Okay, then with that, we will move into our uh, action items, beginning with the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So move. Yes. Oh, I got turned off. Um, is there any discussion? And again, just for the community, if you want to see everything in the consent agenda, it is on board book which is online for you to be able to access. Okay, seeing no more discussion, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Now we'll move into the July through September 2021 donations, and this one will require a resolution. Do we have any discussion on this?
just to thank you again to our community for their seemingly never-ending generosity. So I, Stephanie Malm, introduce the following resolution to move for its adoption as it reads. And then, um, so this is for the District 200, sorry, District 200 donations record from July 2021 to September 2021 that has been generously donated. Um, so I will need a second. Second. Becky Beisel duly seconded the motion for adoption of the foregoing resolution, and we will take a roll call vote. Becky Beisel? Yes. Brian Davis? Yes. Lisa Hadim? Yes. Scott Gergen? Yes. Dave Pemble? Yes. Stephanie Malm? Yes. Kelsey Waits? Yes. Therefore, be it resolved by the Hastings Public School, Public School District School Board to gratefully accept these, don uh, these, these gifts. So as Scott said, thank you very much. We have an incredibly generous community. Okay, we have another resolution um, in order to put in replacement election judges for next week. Um, some judges that we had previously approved uh, could no longer serve, and so we are approving additional judges tonight. So move. Second. I will go ahead and read the, the resolution. I just was waiting for a discussion. <laughs> so <laughs> Lisa Hadeen introduced the following resolution and moved for its adoption, a resolution appointing election judges for the November 2nd, 2021 school district general election. As it reads, and uh, Scott Gergen made, or made a second uh, for that motion of the foregoing resolution. So again, we will take a roll call vote and we will start with Becky Beisel. Yes. Brian Davis. Yes. Lisa Hedin. Yes. Scott Gergen. Yes. Dave Pemble. Yes. Stephanie Malm. Yes. Kelsey Waits. Yes. Whereupon said resolution was declared duly passed and adopted. So next up is that Alpine ski transportation release that I mentioned, um, and this is needed because the Alpine ski team takes a shuttle to and from practice, and so it does have its own release form. So do we have a motion to approve the release? So moved. Exactly. And is there any discussion? Yes, I have a very petty layout conversation. I think the signature should be on the same page as the approval. I say same page that it's um, whatever you're saying. Although I think if you could get your parent to sign just like a blank sheet, <laughs> just requiring a signature and a date, I would totally take that. All righty, fine then. Thank you. That was my comment. That was my meaningful, meaningful comment. <laughs> All right, is there any more discussion? All right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, motion carries. Next is uh, policy 710A, co-curricular and extracurricular um, alternative transportation permission form. I know we had talked about this last month too, but Becky Garcia put so much effort into this last year, wasn't it? <laughs> and here we are changing the document. So um, no, and this this was to just um, provide clarity to to what this actual document means. So we took out, you know, quite a bit of the the verbiage that was, you know, quite frankly very confusing uh, to make sure that parents can understand exactly what they are signing and getting themselves into. So um, that's that's where these red, red lines come from. <laughs> okay, so do we have a motion to approve? So moved. All right, well, Becky, one of them is a second. <laughs> All right, any discussion? 
Okay, so I can't see it in here now, of course, but I felt like I could see it when I reviewed it. My only concern is somewhere up in the top, dense paragraph, I thought it said something about I, being the parent, um, for when we're not providing transportation, I'm fine with all but something below. And I should have highlighted it better than saying in one of the big paragraphs. It was a very poorly written note to myself. It says... Just doing a search. It says, so in the, in the, I think it's the second paragraph. No, it's the, th it's the third paragraph, the, the really first big one. It says, further, I understand that with respect to the alternative transportation I have authorized herein, is that... Is that referring to that list of things that could or couldn't be used that's now gone? And I have to admit, I had a, while it was challenging to read a little bit, I kind of liked that list, because I know the first year my son was getting driven to off-site practices, I did not recognize that was happening until after it had happened. So the reason for the change is because it was reviewed by legal yeah. and gave us the verbiage to use because that upper spot was so confusing. So the statement that you're, you're referring to applies to one of temporary authorized process. So where it defines an authorized adult driver. At least that's my understanding of how it was explained. I can appreciate that a legal review of this would be a much higher quality review than what I can read through it. Um, That's the best explanation but we have I to, have for you. I mean, we have to acknowledge that, that these, this transportation, when we're not providing it to practices, is not happening by parents. Right, and right. that was the thing, was you're authorizing an adult driver which is this section right here. Okay. I'm going to turn my mic off because I'm not sure how to make it clearer. Right. I think maybe I know what you're talking about. So, yes, there is there was that list last year, but it has since collapsed and the definition is now if you if you take a look at that under the temporary ride authorization process paragraph one it does it does talk about the sibling relative parent of another player and anyone of the uh, that the students parent slash guardian names and gives permission to so it, defining what an adult driver is but then going into that list where instead you know last year we had they had to mark what they authorize and what they don't authorize. Does okay, that does help. That helps a lot, actually. Thank you. Um, does the eighteen-year-old, the eighteen age or older, apply all the way to the end of that list? So, if we have a seventeen-year-old football player, they cannot drive another seventeen-year-old football player to Todd Field. That's correct. It, an adult driver is defined as someone 18 years old. Okay. This may be an appropriate review by legal. This may be something we need to revisit from an equity perspective. <laughs> because I think we have a lot of not 18-year-olds that don't have an 18-year-old to get them to places when we're practicing off-site in high school. I'm thinking of morning practice for swim season. It's at the middle school and all the high school kids pile into, you know, Billy's car and you know, whatever and away they go. And as a parent I want to be able to approve that if I want to, but Or having like a sibling who's 16, 17 driving there. Remember, this is for when the district is providing transportation to an event, right? So, 
Okay, but we took out the list of all the ways. We, then I got. Then I didn't follow Stephanie correctly, because. So, we had a whole list of ways, if we were not providing transportation, that you could agree to or not agree to. Those are the ones that have been struck. Yeah. So if the district is not providing transportation. I think the issue that you have is that someone who's not under, someone who is not at least 18 is not considered an adult driver. So the, the thing that you're, you're navigating is not a question of equity, but rather a question of liability. Okay, that's fair. I, I think it's, I think there's a, we may find a pretty significant ripple effect and it might not be equity related because we, especially with practices at Todd in the middle school and the civic arena and the armory, we, we have a community practice to, to solving those problems, the, the transportation challenges. But, right, but I go back to the first statement there, temporarily, when the district is, when district yes. transportation is provided, the right. expectation is you take district transportation, and if you're not gonna take district transportation, this is what you're allowed to do. So this doesn't, this wouldn't apply to early morning swim practice. We don't provide transportation to early morning swim practice. This is, if we're gonna provide a bus to Todd Field to practice, you gotta take the bus, or you gotta have a ride from someone who's 18 years or older. That's what the release is. Okay, and I, and I appreciate that that that's what this release is. And were, were we just trying to make it be too many things in the past? The, the problem was it wasn't clear what an adult driver was with all of the verbiage that was in there. A substantial amount of the verbiage that was in there was not about when we provided transportation, it was about when transportation was not available. So the struck language mm -hmm. is, was not necessarily about an adult driver, although a component of it was. It's all it for, was about what do you do when the district does not provide transportation? What are you willing to let your student do? And my understanding is the only time that the district isn't providing transportation is for alpine skiing, which is why there's an additional signature for alpine skiing. Because alpine skiing goes to Welch Village. Correct. And we have... And they, and they do provide transportation, right? We are providing transportation. They. We provide transportation. Right. So I said that incorrectly. It's the only place where we're, in my understanding, where we're in the situation where we provide transportation, but kids would go on their own because otherwise kids would have to drive all the way back yeah. to Hastings and then drive back to their house. And so the alpine skiing allows the kids to drive to Welch and then drive directly home if they live in Vermilion. That makes complete sense to me. But I, and, and maybe somebody else can help me out, but I feel like I'm talking about something different. Well, I, the only thing I can tell you is I there's, get it. there's we risk with training. kids driving trips. I mean, the bottom line is there's risk driving and liability when kids are driving other kids to events. I agree. <laughs> I agree. And, and I completely appreciate that if the district is providing transportation, our expectation is that you will be on it. Except when you provide, you know, you, know, these other, you meet these, these limited criteria, these limited circumstances. Again, where I'm a little bit lost in this change is last year, we started to address what about when the district doesn't provide transportation. We expanded this document to not be about here's your liability concerns and here's your coverage of 
when we provide transportation. We expanded it, all that struck verbiage is about when we're not providing transportation, because we practice away from the buildings, here's different ways that your student can be accommodated. Are you okay with them? Are you okay with your student riding with another student? Are you okay with them riding with the parents of another student? And, he, and you could decide. And now we've struck all of that. Well, I can So are we not speaking? Are we not speaking to that question of when we do not provide transportation? All I can tell you is that the original reason for even looking at it came out of the athletic department. Yeah, and I think in a couple of years ago, maybe even before you got on the board, Brian, you and I talked about this one time because Drew and Simon were at the exact same place trying to hustle bustle back for a band concert and you had to drive and Judy had to drive because at that time it could only be your parent that drove you. Brian couldn't have driven my son and I couldn't have driven Brian's son. That was the previous language. So this is expanding it to say, yeah, I could say, Brian, could you bring both boys home from Tartan and come down to the band concert? Um, and we don't have time to wait for the bus. And so I can see that coming out. This other piece I'm just, I mean, we've, we've survived as a district for decades without it. I, the, only, the only thing we had back then was, the, okay, the only thing we had back then was that Hanson, Trent had to sign off on it. It actually wasn't even Trent at the time. I think it was Mike Johnson's thought. But even, not Mike Johnson. Um, Tom Johnson, thank you. Uh, Tom had to sign off, and then we could have our own kids, but you're right, it was only our own kids that we could take. That was it. So, so I think this is another level of being able to cover ourselves a little bit better. I think we're trying to get to, right? So as I read it, this policy is covering both when the district is and is not providing transportation. So the part down at the bottom, the temporary ride authorization process that talks about having an adult mentions um, the 18 years old. However, if we look up here, and I think this is where you're getting that maybe we need to fix it, is... Right here, yeah, that's the further I found the Yeah, door. where it says the word below, because then that, I think, is referencing the list that we came up with, because this paragraph, if we look at the paragraph above, says that the district may not provide transportation, and in that case, here's what I give permission for, right? So I think the word below was meant to go to the list that we've now struck. And I, I think you're correct in that, um, because up at the top it is addressing when the district does not provide transportation, but the temporary ride authorization process is discussing when transportation is provided. So I think the word below needs to be struck from that. Did that maybe address it? That does address it, and that's what that's what popped out at me when I was reading it before. Um, now I'm quick re -re trying to reread that paragraph. I'm not sure if, if we're not going to have a range of authors. I don't know what the exact edit is. If we're not going to have a, an alternative range of authorized transportation methods, maybe that not that whole paragraph has to go, but we just need to clean up that paragraph. Yeah, to make it clear, the bit where it says the district makes no representations or assurances regarding the safety or condition of any vehicles used, insurance coverage, etc. But make sure we clean up the bit where it is referencing the list below that we've now struck, because that's an edit that we missed yeah, in this. Okay. So okay. That it took five minutes to no, that's okay. I just had to like go through it a couple times and figure out where the problem is. So then we do have a motion and a second on the table, but it sounds like we have some adjustments we need to make to clean this up a bit more um, to bring it back next month okay. to adjust those couple sentences. So now in this case, I'm not sure we've ever done this before, do we need to withdraw the motions? Okay, so who seconded and who put the motion in? You have that. We kind of tied, so how do we? <laughs> yeah, we got credit. 
Okay, Brian, you seconded. Oh, so I'm withdrawing my second then on this motion. Okay. All right, so then we will bring this back for, um, for next month and we'll get that cleaned up. Okay, good talk. Next up is the health and safety measures. So based on our discussion, the recommendation was uh, to change, essentially add E under current timeline and specifics, to read face covering levels will remain in place for a minimum of two weeks beginning the Monday following the date which the 14 day per 10,000 rate drops below a threshold set point number. So, do we have a motion to approve the proposed changes to the face covering resolution with the amendments proposed? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Bond projects for approval. So, do we have a motion to approve the following bond projects? ALC. Uh, Hastings High School Lecture Hall Seating, Hastings High School Baseball Field Drainage, Hastings Middle School Track Replacement, and the Hastings High School Team Locker Room Privacy Improvements. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Last up is just our future meetings. So you'll see that now that the Community Engagement Committee has their regular meetings set up, that those are scheduled all the way through May of next year. Um, but otherwise, upcoming meetings, uh, the policy No, I have our next meeting is uh, December 2nd. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think you said you were going to Tilden. Yeah, exactly. And we have a work session on November 10th and a regular school board meeting on November. I'm going to check because I can't remember. It was 23rd. <laughs> right, which is the 23rd. Okay, just making sure there wasn't another adjustment to make. Um, so those will be what's coming up this next month. All right, so with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right, meeting is 